ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 12th Z Jaipur Literature Festival's Char Bagh. We are delighted to introduce session number 89, The Romanovs, presented by J. Paul Getty Trust Series. With a dazzling literary flair, drawing on new archival research, The Romanovs is an enthralling chronicle of triumph, tragedy, love and death, a study of power and a portrait of the empire that still defines Russia today. We have with us Richard Evans to introduce Simon Seabag Montefiore. Please join me in welcoming them with a big hand. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Richard Evans. I'm a historian of modern Europe and mainly on Germany, but I've learned an enormous amount from Simon Seabag Montefiore's wonderfully and grippingly readable books on Russia. He's written uh, a, a terrific biography of uh, uh, Potemkin. Uh, he's written about uh, various subjects. Young Stalin was a particularly interesting uh, 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 project. Um, he's also written about Jerusalem. He has a very wide range of books. His books have been translated into 48 languages, which I think is a testimony to not just to their readability, but also to the very deep and original research that he carries out, in, particularly in Russian sources, which are not always the easiest to get access to. And his uh, book, the way he's going to be discussing this afternoon, is The Romanovs, uh, which is a kind of family history. But what a family. I think about 80% of the, about 40% of the books is about sex, about 40% about violence, and then 20% about politics. And he, I think, for me at any rate, and I know a little bit about them, he has put the czars who ruled Russia uh, up to 1917 in a, a new context and maybe think about them differently. It's a terrifically exciting piece of work and I recommend it to all of you. So uh, please give a very warm welcome to Simon Seabag Montefiore. Ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be back here, um, uh, back in Jaipur. I haven't been here for about 10 years and since then, I've written, um, two, two, I've written about Jerusalem, and I've written this book about the Romanovs. And the reason why I wrote this book, I think I'll start with that, is that I wanted to find a book that explained Putin, Russia today, and that explained it by looking back across history. And I looked for such a book, and I couldn't find it. And I always follow the rule of my hero, Benjamin Disraeli, who said, when I want to read a book, I write it. And so, in tribute to him, um, I've written the Romanos that really takes Russian leadership right up uh, from 1613 through Stalin and right up to Putin and today. Now, um, the fascinating thing about the Romanovs is that we all feel there's a curse. And I'm gonna start off by giving you a series of scenes from the, Roman, the history of the dynasty, across history. I'm not gonna try and tell you the whole story. I'm gonna give you some snapshots and introduce you to some of the characters. And somehow, we'll get to the end. And we're gonna begin at the end in a way too. Because you might think that there was a curse over the, the Romanov dynasty. That's the usual story. And certainly, it was a very dangerous thing to be a czar. Six out of the 12 of the last Romanov czars were murdered, which gives you an idea of what a risky enterprise it was to rule the Russian Empire. And there's a relevance in this today. Putin is regarded from the outside as a figure of boundless power. This is why Donald Trump has a sort of almost boyish crush on, on Vladimir Putin. He thinks that he's a guy who really knows how to get things done who really had the absolute power that Trump wants. Trump, after all, wants to be the first American czar. But actually, to be a czar, to have the absolute power of the Kremlin, is actually an extremely dangerous profession. And it's only maintainable with ferocious vigilance. Putin is a master of that. And the successful rulers of Russia are all masters of that, too. Let us start on the 17th of July, 1918, at the House of No Purpose, in Yekaterinburg, almost a century, just over a century ago. 
At two in the morning at night, the Tsar's family were woken up. There were the parents, Nicholas and Alexandra. There were the four children, Olga, Tatiana, Maria, and Anastasia. And the little boy, the boy with hemophilia, Alexei Tsarevich. And then there was an entourage, the family doctor, a couple of maids, whose names tragically are often forgotten. And they were woken up at two in the morning. They weren't worried or more worried than usual. They were often woken up in the, in the night by their jailers. And furthermore, the whites were getting closer. They expected to move at any moment. But they awoke, bleary-eyed. They'd spent time preparing. They knew they were going to be moved. And they came downstairs together, the father carrying the boy. When they came downstairs, to their surprise, they weren't taken outside to the courtyard where, where a truck was running, was, was waiting with its engine running, but they were taken down to the cellars of the house, of the Ipatiev house, the house once owned by the merchant of Ipatiev. And when they went down there, they were told to wait. Alexandra was unwell. She asked for a seat. A seat was brought. And another seat was brought for the boy, Alexei, who'd recently suffered a hemophiliac attack and was recovering. And there they waited, standing behind the seats, almost like a family portrait. And at that moment, Yakov Yurovsky, the leader of the local Chekhov killer unit, filed in with 11 or 12 assassins, all carrying not just rifles, but several pistols too, and with bayonets fixed. And then the family looked on and, and watched. I'm going to take you back 324 years to when this story really began, the creation of the Romanov dynasty. In 1613, Russia was a failed state. It had been invaded from every side, from Sweden, from Crimea, from Poland, to such an extent that the Poles had actually occupied the Kremlin, occupied Moscow. They'd ruined the Kremlin. Bodies lay around it. The palaces had no roofs. The crown jewels had been stolen and sent back to Warsaw. And at this point, a Russian national revival took place. And they began to look for a czar who could reunite the fallen czardom of Russia and expel the, uh, the invaders. If you'd looked at Russia then, it might have been a bit like looking at Syria today. You might have thought it was a failed state that would never again be an integral working polity ever again in its history. And indeed, we might now be discussing the Polish Empire, or a resurgent vast Poland, or a vast resurgent Ukraine, rather than Russia that we are discussing. And the reason why we are discussing it has much to do with what happened at an assembly held by soldiers and Cossacks and princes and lords. They needed to choose a czar. Since there were three wars going on, as well as several civil wars, you might expect that they would choose a famous field marshal, a swaggering warlord, but they didn't. They, in fact, chose the exact opposite. They were aware that the process was rather like the moment in the Bible, which they, of course, all knew well, the moment that the high priest of the temple, of the Jewish temple, chose King David as the next king. Of, of Israel, to unite the tribes of Israel. And it was a similar situation. They searched for someone unblemished, innocent, but with potential, and they came across Michael Romanov, the great nephew of the favorite wife of the late Ivan the Terrible. Ivan the Terrible and his son Theodore had been the last heirs of the great Rurikid dynasty that had ruled Russia, Ukraine, Kievian Rus, uh, the Grand Duchy of Moscow, since the ninth century conversion to Christianity. And now that, that, that family was extinct. Who was going to rule Russia? The strange thing is, all these bishops and lords and princes, they chose a boy of 17 or 16. He was very far from a swaggering warlord. He had a stammer. He was illiterate. He had a limp. He had an eye tick and a twitch. 
Can you imagine anyone less suited? Furthermore, his powerful father was actually in a Polish prison. But that was an advantage. He was controlled by nobody. There was another slight problem. He wasn't in Moscow. In fact, no one knew where he was. But they didn't care. They elected him Tsar of all the Russias. A title, by the way, no one wanted. All the last holders of that title had been murdered one by one. And those included the three false Dimitris that you may have heard of, all of whom were imposters claiming to be the vanished Prince Dimitri. So they elected him, chose him. They united all the factions with this boy. And then they began to think, where the hell is he? And they had to go and find him. But somebody else was looking for him too. The Swedes and the Poles also heard that he'd been chosen Tsar. And they decided that the best way to keep Russia from ever reuniting was to kill him first. They both dispatched hit squads. Sounds almost like today, doesn't it? They both dispatched hit squads to kill Michael Romanov before the boyars and the, the bishops of Moscow could reach him. From Moscow, a cavalcade set forth of all the grandest, richest, and most powerful men in Russia. They were looking for this boy. And the boy was last seen somewhere on the family estates near Kostroma. And they headed, they headed north. And as they headed out there, they hoped to find him before the Poles. But the Poles had reached Kostroma first. And they began to search, combing the place to find this boy, to kill him as quickly as possible. They heard he was with his mother, but otherwise unattended. And this was true. They found a peasant who worked on the family estates, Ivan Susanim, and they tortured him to find out where the boy was. He didn't give it away. They tortured him to death, and that became part of the Romanov legend. Members of that peasant's family attended every coronation feast of the family right the way through to 1896 with the last Tsar. So they failed to find him, and finally, the boyars and the bishops found out that Michael was with his mother at the Epatiath Monastery. They, they arrived in the middle of the night. The family were asleep. They asked them to be woken up. His mother was very nervous. Many of the family had been murdered by different czars, and they were, they were extremely frightened for the boy's welfare. His father was in prison, probably never to return. He was virtually the last of the family. But, as I explained, he had this miraculous connection, descent from Ivan the Terrible's favorite wife. And he was the nephew of the last Rurik Tsar, Tsar Theodore. So this was the last connection with legitimacy, with history, with the heritage going back to the ninth century. And the boy was woken up, another little boy, woken up in the middle of the night with a horrible surprise. His mother said, what do you want? They said, we've elected Michael Tsar. She said, go away. We don't want to hear from you ever again. We refuse the crown. There's a touch of, I don't know if any of you know those sketches from, from Monty Python, but there's a touch of that about this woman. She says, she says to them, go away. They said, we've come to make him Tsar. She said, I don't care about being Tsar. Go away, we don't want you. And she started to scream at them. They said, listen, I'm sorry, but we have, we have assembled all the great and the good, all the peerage, all the bishops. They're waiting downstairs. Please bring the boy down. She brought him down. She didn't tell him yet what they wanted. When they got down there, they all fell to their knees and prostrated themselves on the ground. It must have been quite a sight in the courtyard of this ancient monastery. And the boy looked at his mother and said, you know, what is this? And they said, we have elected you all hail, the Tsar of all the Russias. And he burst into tears, as well you might. Many times in this story, people who were told they were about to be Tsar of Russia burst into tears. The most famous of them was Tsar Nicholas II himself. He always claimed that he was unprepared, and when he, when he succeeded to the throne, he burst into tears. How unlike his powerful father, Alexander III, 
known as the Colossus, all man, a giant who could who could rip up a, a uh, who could rip up a, a pack of cards, who could bend the girder of a railroad railway um, sleeper, and yet when he found out he was heir, he had also burst into tears. In fact, every czar since 1801 had burst into tears on finding that he was heir to the throne of Russia. And the reason isn't very hard to see. It was the same for Michael. You were quite likely to be killed in, 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 on your throne. Worse than that, the problems of Russia were, were, were to multiply many times. So that by the time Nicholas II succeeded to the throne, you know, maybe even a great Tsar like Catherine or Peter couldn't have solved the problems of Russia. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Michael was elected Tsar. He agreed to, um, to march back with them, back to Moscow. On the way, his mother discovered there were no crown jewels, no palaces, nowhere to stay, just burnt out, gutted ruins, no jewels. She said, my Michael is not going to go into Moscow until he has the jewels and he has the palace. So they stopped at a, they stopped at a, a monastery outside Moscow and they waited. When he arrived, you wouldn't have given him much chance. Here was a boy who could command nothing, who knew nothing. But the warlords took control and they, they defeated one by one the invaders of Russia and restored the state self-consciously and they established the Romanov dynasty. One important detail that comes from this story is that they were established as a, as a military headquarters. The Romanovs would be different from the Rura kids. They had been sacred, sacred figures, almost priest-like, uh, almost priest-like czars. The Romanovs would always be a military dynasty. They would behave like commanders and chiefs. Their court would be run like a military headquarters. And that goes right the way through to the Bolsheviks and to Putin today. That's the nature of the presidency of Russia, of the executive of Russia, as created in these years after 1613. By the time he died in 1645, this, this dynasty was established. He was succeeded by his son, who was a remarkable person. And his son was Peter the Great. Peter was one of the most extraordinary figures ever to rule any country. First of all, he was six foot seven. Can you imagine? Everything about him was exceptional. He was terrifying of visage. He had a twitching face. Um, he suffered from epileptic fits. He was absolutely ruthless, but he was also absolutely brilliant. The image of him as a kind of cheerful figure who cut people's beards off and made people throw away their caftans and put on Germanic military uniforms um, is only partly true. Yes, he was a reformer, but he was a Russian reformer. He was a ruthless tyrant. But he had three of the great gifts of a politician. He knew what he wanted to do. He had the acumen to actually do it, and he had the resources to do, make it happen. Every politician dreams of those three things, and he had all three. But he was also a brutal, brutal character. As a little boy, he'd seen his godfather, his uncles, torn from his hands in the revolt of the Streltsy guards. He'd held out, he tried, held out his hand to try and grab them. They'd been ripped from his hand, taken to the balcony on which he stood, and tossed off the balcony to be impaled on the raised spears and lances of the musketeer guards. He'd seen that sight, and it marked him. It made him into a brutal character. When, when he finally turned on the Streltsy and, um, and created his own, uh, his, his own guard, reg, guards regiments that became the heart of the Tsarist army, he insisted on not only in torturing the Streltsy himself, but also executing them himself. Think of Saddam Hussein when he seized power. Remember how he personally executed his enemies, called out their names, and personally made his top uh, princes and top henchmen shoot them himself, themselves. Same thing with Peter the Great. He set up 12 houses of torture chambers, and he worked his way along this 12, back and forth, for days on end, helping to torture these people. He overthrew his own half-sister, 
and, she, and he hanged the, hanged the bodies of these guards outside her window, leaving the, body there, the bodies there for years on end so they would rot in front of her window. And her only view would be that rotting. When she finally dared to have an affair, after years and years on alone in this monastery, he arrested the person she had an affair with for Lay's majesty and tortured him, impaled him on his, up his rectum, and then beheaded him and dismembered him in, in Red Square. This was a brutal character. When it came to the executions, he personally chopped off many of the heads. And he was fascinated, not just by, hum the, by human life, but by human death too, the human body. He was a man who was an expert on engineering, on building ships, and on artillery, on building guns. He changed Russian history by creating a modern artillery regiment, by creating a modern army, the guards. And when he came to execute people, he showed the same fascination. Um, one, of the, one of the people he was executing showed great courage. He kicked away the head of the person before him and said, execute me now. Peter the Great said, this man shall live and forgave him for his courage. And he became one of his top officers. And he was the grandfather of Prince Orloff, the, lo the lover of, Peter, of Catherine the Great, who came much later that same century. But at the same time, he experimented in executions himself, timing the amount of time that the body sat up with their, after their heads had been removed. When he went on tour in Holland, he, Holland was then the technical center of the world, and he went there to learn about the latest ships, to learn about the latest guns. He also visited London and Paris, but Holland was the place you went for high tech in that time. And while he was there, he attended medical lectures. He became fascinated to see how they conducted the dissection of bodies. And they used a special set of tools. He bought the set of tools for himself. And afterwards, he went up and he asked the doctors and surgeons if he could feel the dead bodies that they were dissecting. Then he asked if he could bite the bodies. They allowed him to. He bent over and sunk his teeth into the dead flesh. He then called up his entire entourage and insisted that they too should sink their teeth into the bodies that were being dissected on, st on stage. It was not easy being one of Peter the Great's henchmen. Even worse, after that, he suddenly remembered that one of his henchmen, one of his courtiers, had been grumbling about having a sore tooth. He said, I've seen how they do it in Holland. I can be a doctor too. Peter the Great believed he could do everything. So he personally pulled the teeth out of his henchmen. And then he remembered there was another one who had a sore foot. Peter insisted on amputating it himself. After that, if you had an ache or a pain and you were in Peter's court, you sure as hell didn't mention it. So in 1719, Peter was already the great. He was already the first emperor. He was already the man who'd created a new Russian empire. Russian czars had been called czar, of course, after Caesar. Now he added another Roman title, Emperator. And from now on, all czars are both emperors and, and czars. And in 1719, something fascinating started to happen in his court, something which disturbed him. Aborted babies were found around the court three times. All the courts started to look for where these babies came from. Peter, for example, took the human life very seriously. He'd read the Bible. He was a religious man as well as being a master of technology. One day he called in his assistant, his aide-de-camp, and he called him in, he said, well, he shouted at him. The aide-de-camp was so frightened, he fell to his knees and said, I'll tell you about the babies. Peter said, I was only going to ask you where I'd lost my, if you, if you, where I'd, where I'd lost my papers. But the aide-de-camp was on his knees. And Peter said, now you can tell me about these bodies. And the aide-de-camp admitted that he'd been having an affair with the most beautiful of all Peter's ladies-in-waiting, Mary Hamilton. Yes, she was of Scottish descent. She was blonde. She was blue-eyed. She was 19 years old. And she was the mistress of, P of Peter himself. He had many mistresses. And Peter was shocked to find out that the adjutant had been sleeping with his mistress. He was even more shocked to find out 
that she'd been aborting her babies every time she got pregnant and leaving them, um, exposing them in the cold outside. So he, he ordered the arrest of her and the adjutant, and they were, of course, tortured. But before being, before being fully tortured, she said, I confess everything. I killed the babies to protect my virtue, and I, I plead guilty. Everyone at court, everyone at court knew that Mary Hamilton was the mistress of Peter. And she was also the lady-in-waiting of the Tsarina, Peter's wife. She knew about their relationship, and she loved her. Everyone loved Mary Hamilton. No one believed that she'd be sentenced to death, but she was sentenced to death. And on the day, when the day came, everyone knew that she'd be pardoned. Peter himself walked with her to the gibbet. She was in a white dress. They walked together. And as they got close, she started to shake, and Peter held her hand. And he took her up onto the, onto the stage, and he, there, there, was the, there was the swordsman, there was the block. And everyone waited. Everyone knew about their relationship. Everyone knew how adored she was by everyone, by the queen. Everyone knew that the Tsarina had asked for her life. And Peter whispered to her. And what he said to her in a, in a, in a loud enough whisper for the crowd to hear was, you will die for murder. Mur Death is the only punishment in the Bible for murder. She fainted, and her head was taken off instantly. But that wasn't the end of the story. The crowd, the Russian Muscovite crowd had seen many terrible things, and they were used to seeing people literally eviscerated, anally impaled, suffer every manner of horrible torture in Red Square. But they'd never seen a girl of 19, um, and such a darling of the court, executed like that. But Peter wasn't finished. He picked up the head, and he held it up, and he said to the crowd, now you've seen that, I'm going to give you a quick anatomy lesson. And he started to point out the spinal column, the aorta, the throat, uh, the brains, the crowd, even the Muscovite crowd, which was a pretty rough crowd, as you can imagine, groaned, audibly groaned. Peter then kissed the head on the lips, tossed it in a basket, and said, right, everyone go back to work. That, ladies and gentlemen, was Peter the Great. I'm going to jump ahead a bit. One of the strange things about the Russian court in the 18th century was that Peter the Great murdered his son. He murdered his own son, tortured him to death for disloyalty, for treason. This caused a problem for the dynasty, a shortage of male heirs. And therefore, even though Russia is one of the most chauvinist countries in the world even today, Russia had more empresses in their own right than virtually any other, than any other country in Europe. Um, Peter's own wife succeeded to the throne. Then his daughter seized power. At one point, it was ruled by an extraordinary character called Grand Duchess uh, Anna Leopoldovna in 1740 to 41. She was interesting because of a very modern aspect about her. She was bisexual, and she had an affair, she had an affair with fiancé, who was the Saxon ambassador, but she also had an affair with her lady-in-waiting. And to solve the problem of how to sleep with the lady-in-waiting and to sleep with her fiancé, her fiance, she decided to marry them to each other, not to marry him herself, but to marry him to her lady-in-waiting, with whom she was also having an affair. Their letters uh, are fascinating because in them she refers to him and her as, as he, her, he slash her, which is like very 2019, isn't it? It almost defines fluidity, but this is in 1740. But she was overthrown in a coup d'etat by Elisaveta, uh, Peter's daughter, beautiful daughter. Anyway, she brought from Germany a 14-year-old girl to marry her deeply unattractive, uh, deeply unempathetic, deeply untalented heir, Peter III. And this girl was Catherine the Great, Catherine the Second. On the 28th of June, 1762, she was asleep at a small uh, villa outside St. Petersburg. And suddenly, she was awoken. Alexei Orlov, the grandson of the man who kicked the head away from his own execution, uh, burst into her room. And he was the brother 
of her, her lover of the time, Grigory Orlov. They were both guards officers. They were planning to overthrow the hated Peter III, who was Catherine's husband. She woke up and sat up in her bed, still in her nightdress, and he said, the plot has been exposed. They're torturing our fellow plotters. Today, we either take the throne or we will all hang. And as you've seen, just because Catherine was married to the Tsar, it didn't mean that she would be safe. After all, Peter the, Peter the Great had killed his own son, so had Ivan the Terrible. It was a bit of a Russian habit. She jumped up. She said, what do we do? He said, we, we head for Petersburg now. We seize the throne. Get dressed. She pulled on a dress. She didn't even have time to do her hair. She jumped into a carriage. It was two in the morning. Dawn was almost rising. They whipped the, they whipped the horses, and they turned the carriage round, and they headed back to St. Petersburg and galloped through the night, jumping on the back of the carriage, an incredibly good-looking, giant young man who was only 20 years old rode on the back, and his name was Potemkin, Prince uh, Grigory Potemkin, who became her life's partner, her lover, her prime minister, um, her best friend, and the partner in her greatest successes. But at the time, she was 10 years older than him. At the time, he was nobody. And the carriage was galloping towards St. Petersburg. Halfway, they met another carriage. In the carriage was Grigory Orloff, her lover. But almost as important, Michelle, her French hairdresser. It was very important in the 18th century to look good. And so, the hairdresser jumped into her carriage and did her hair on the way to the revolution. By the time she arrived at the barracks and the Winter Palace, her hair was perfect, and she looked like an empress. She stepped out, and she was hailed as Catherine II, empress and tsarina of all the Russias. But meanwhile, it turned out that her husband was not in St. Petersburg, but was at another palace outside uh, St. Petersburg. First of all, she was hailed by all the troops. And then she gathered up her entire army, 10,000 men, the entire guards regiments founded by, founded by Peter the Great. And they stood, they stood outside in the, the uh, square outside the Winter Palace, which you've, many of you have probably seen. And they stood there. It was dawn, a gray dusk. And she came out. And Potemkin was holding her horse. She climbed onto it, a beautiful horse, and then he climbed onto his horse beside her. As they rode together to lead the, uh, to lead the parade, lead the march to Peterhof, where her husband was, she said, I'll ride ahead now. After all, she was the Tsarina. He was a sergeant. He said, fine. He tried to move his horse, but the horse, horses were trained to ride in cavalry squadron, and his horse would not turn away. Later, he said, you know, I, I owe my success, I owe a whole empire to one disobedient horse. Finally, she rode on ahead, and they rode through the night. When they arrived at, to find the Tsar, he was in tears, sobbing. He'd realized that he'd lost the throne. And when she walked in, he fell to his knees and begged for his life. She walked out. She never saw him again. He begged for permission just to have his mistress and his pet monkey and his little, his violin with him. And she gave permission. Two weeks later, the Orloff brothers strangled him to death. He was laid out as a, as a former czar, and at his funeral, it was said in a press statement, because even in, even in 18th century Russia, when the czar died, there had to be a press statement. The press statement declared that he died of hemorrhoids. Years later, when Diderot, the French philosopher, was invited to Russia by Catherine the Great with a vast salary, she said, please come. And he said, I can't go, despite the salary. And one of his friends said, are you crazy? You've been offered like the biggest salary a, a writer's ever been offered to go and live at the Russian court. Why didn't you go? He said, I have a confession. I suffer from hemorrhoids. And he said, in Russia, hemorrhoids can be a fatal disease. That's how she became Tsar.
Now I'm jumping ahead, almost 30 years. She was succeeded by her son, Paul I, known as Paul the Mad. People used to say, and in fact, Catherine herself uh, rather, uh, rather spitefully and maliciously said that Paul couldn't, wasn't, wasn't the son of her husband, Peter III, but was the son of one of her lovers. She said this because she had hated her husband, and she came to hate her son too. Paul grew up very bitter, very untalented, and lacking that vital thing in politics, empathy, empathy, the ability to win people over, to understand what other people are thinking, to sense an audience, for example. And um, Catherine was a master at this. In her love of Potemkin, she found, first of all, a sexual partner, but really a political partner. And someone who knew them well said, no wonder they're so in love, they're exactly the same. They were the two of the most talented statesmen Russia ever produced. He came from a poor gentry household in Smolensk. She wasn't even Russian or Romanov, she was a German princess. But together, they took the Crimea, they took Ukraine, they, bought, they, they created Russia as a Near Eastern power in the Middle East. At one point, they bombarded Syria. Many parallels with today, which is one reason why my book, Catherine, Catherine the Great and Potemkin, is being republished in Russia today. But they achieved an amazing amount. Their love letters are astonishing. And I do recommend, they're, they're also in my, the book, my Romanov's book. Um, they're passionate, they're extraordinary, they're political, they're about everything. They're some of the greatest love letters ever written. Um, but the son, for Catherine's son, every, every minute that Potemkin, this flamboyant and brilliant character, existed, every moment he ruled with, with Catherine was agony. Paul wanted to rule himself. And finally, he succeeded to the throne. Potemkin was dead. But, but Paul had his bones taken out of his tomb and thrown onto the ground. And so Paul succeeded. Within a very short time, exactly like his father, Peter III, he managed to alienate every part of Russian society. The guards, the army, the church, the aristocracy. He had aristocrats beaten. He was, he was a martinet, a parado-maniac. He insisted on having parades and Germanic rules for everything. And soon people began to think he was mad. One of the people, one of the only people he trusted was his barber. His barber, Count Kutazov. But he wasn't born a count. He was actually a Turkish slave boy given to Paul as a present. And he became Paul's valet and his barber shaved him every day. And in, the, in, a, in a sign that we see today in Russia, even now, he chose this person to be a count. He gave him vast estate, and he became really one of the chief ministers of Russia. But even while Paul was doing all this, his courtiers hated him, and they began to plan to kill him. They began to plan to kill him. On the 1st of March, uh, 1801, Count Peter van der Palen, who was in effect the prime minister of Russia, uh, along with all the young aristocrats of uh, St. Petersburg, about 300 of them, met to drink champagne in the Winter Palace. And they then took toasts, deaf to the tyrant, and they then marched out to the Mikarkovsky uh, Palace, the fortress newly built by Paul to be secure against this very thing. And they broke into the palace, and they all marched up towards Paul's room. And they broke into his room. They burst in. They looked around. No Paul. Had he escaped? There were many escape routes from Paul's bedroom. They looked around, and then they looked at, a, they looked at the bed. They felt the bed. And one of them said, he's been here very recently. They checked his mistress's room. He wasn't there. He had to be in the room somewhere. And then they saw a pair of feet underneath one of the tapestries. And they pulled it down. And there is the emperor of all the Russias, the descendant of Peter the Great, shivering in his nightshirt and nightcap. They grabbed him in. And they said, you've got to abdicate. Downstairs, on the floor underneath this scene, was the bedroom of his son, Alexander. Alexander was very young. He was in his early 20s. And there he was. They'd asked him if he would agree 
to the assassination of his own father. The Romanovs are not like other families, by the way. He agreed to it implicitly. He waited downstairs. He'd been told that Paul would not be killed. But of course, upstairs, Paul started to resist. He started to, he started to threaten the uh, conspirators. And one of them grabbed a huge um, inkstand embossed with silver, and they smashed him in the face with it. His eye popped out. Moments later, they jumped on him, and they sat on him, and they, they grabbed a, um, a scarf of his cordon bleu, his, one of the top Russian orders that you often see people in portraits wearing, and they wrapped it around his neck, and his, one, of his, one of his French valets sat on his feet, and they strangled him right there. He was so hated by the guards that that wasn't the end of it, ladies and gentlemen. All the guards then burst in and stomped on the Tsar physically with their boots. By the end of this, it was not a pretty sight. And meanwhile, downstairs, young Alexander waited to hear the news of his father, hoping that he succeeded to the throne but was still, al but was still alive and able to retire to the countryside. Half an hour later, Count van der Palen came downstairs and said to him, grow up, boy, you're czar, you're emperor. And Alexander said, but, but, but my father, where is he? He said, he's dead. We killed him. You're the czar. Alexander burst into tears. He was the first of the czars to burst into tears. And from this moment, everyone else who succeeded did so. So he succeeded to the throne he was tormented always by the murder of his father just feet away with his permission. And this is the nature of the Romanov power. This is the nature of Russian power. I think, because we're running out of time, I'm going to leap ahead. Alexander I was, of course, the Tsar who defeated Napoleon and who marched all the way from Moscow, which Napoleon had taken, and marched, put together a coalition and marched all the way to Paris where he overthrew Napoleon. Quite an achievement. Really the high point, 18, 1850, 1814, the high point of Russian history in the 19th century. Not really equaled again until Stalin uh, took Berlin in 1945. And Stalin, by the way, who loved history, always mentioned this, this fact. When Avril Harriman, the US ambassador, said to him, uh, General Marshal Stalin, congratulations, you have taken Berlin. Stalin said quick as a flash, yes, but Alexander took Paris. So um, I'm jumping ahead to another tragic day, and we're doing, tragic, we're doing tragic moments in the dynasty today. It's 1881. It's the 1st of March, 19, 1881. The Tsar is Alexander II, the great, the, the nephew, the nephew of Alexander I and Nicholas I, and son of Nicholas I. He was probably the most attractive of all of the, all of the Romanov Tsars, except Catherine. He was good looking. He was six foot four. He was um, strapping. He was blonde and blue eyed. He, um, he was genial. He was not anti Semitic. The Romanovs were all fervently anti Semitic, especially Nicholas II and his father and Alexandra. But I never found a word that Alexander II said against the Jews. He, um, he had liberated the Russian serfs in 1861. So he was known as the Tsar Emancipator. And he was a charming character. But he'd been hunted for 15 years by Russian terrorists, nihilists, uh, anarchists, uh, early socialists, who were determined to kill him, who had anticipated greater reforms than he was ever willing to give in the 1860s. And they were determined to destroy the monarchy. In 1865, he'd been walking in the park in St. Petersburg when, it, when the first assassination attempt took place. That day, in the park, he had met a most beautiful girl. He was about 40, she was about 18, and um, they fell in love. They recognized in each other Alexander II and Katya, Princess Dolgorukaya, they recognize in each other a same liberal spirit, but also an incredible uh, ultra-sexuality that they shared. 
he'd always been a great womanizer, a great lover. Uh, she was a virgin. But, grad but gradually, he fell in love, they fell in love with each other, and they became lovers. Their correspondence, which is in the Romanovs, is an amazing love story. There are over 4,000 love letters, and I've used some of them in there. All I will say to you about those letters is that they haven't been published before, and that they are the most erotic and outrageous love letters ever written by a head of state in any era, even in the age of sects and texts in the 21st century. I'll say no more about it. But she had been his comfort as terrorist gangs hunted him down. They blew up his train, he survived. They blew up the Winter Palace, he survived. There were six attempts, and he was told that he would survive six attempts. On this day in 1881, he insisted on going out to, uh, to inspect his troops. His, his wife, as she'd become, Princess Yurovskaya, his mistress Katya, the, the schoolgirl he'd met all those years before, 16 years earlier, begged him not to go. She says that, she said they're hunting you down. Before he went out, he did two things, both very characteristic. He ordered, uh, he signed an order that there should be elected assemblies in the Russian state. An amazing revolutionary reform that could have led to Russian democracy that could have changed all of history. Lenin himself said it was one of those moments that could have changed the whole course of history. If it had succeeded, if he'd lived, if he'd lived, there may never have been a Bolshevik revolution. All of history could be different. He signed the order to, um, to move this project onwards. Then he sent everyone out of the room and he made love to his wife, Katya, one last time. And then he went out. As he galloped out, terrorist gangs were waiting. They knew there were two routes to the parade, and they were, they were covering both. In one of them, they had a shop full of, um, a cheese shop, in fact, full of explosives. And in the other one, they waited at a team of about four assassins with bombs. As the Tsar approached, they threw grenades and blew up uh, the horses and the guard. But Alexander was fine. He was untouched. His aide-de-camp said to him, you've survived, please go back to the Winter Palace. He said, no, I'm a czar, I'm an emperor, I must inspect the wounded. As he did so, a young man who has had his back to the scene and who was looking out at, the, at, the, at one of the canals turned round and tossed a bomb right at his feet. It blew his legs off. He was carried back to the Winter Palace bleeding to death. In the Winter Palace, his distraught mistress wife, Princess Yurovskaya, couldn't believe that her worst nightmare had come true. He was carried up to his, his study and laid down. Across town, a little boy, not even 10 years old, was going skating. He had his skates around his neck. His name was Nicholas. He was the grandson of Alexander II. His father was the heir to the throne. They all looked up, they were going skating. What was that blast? And they had a sinking feeling. They were called immediately to the Winter Palace and they ran. They ran, they got in a, they got in a sleigh and they went to the Winter Palace. And the little boy was still holding his skates when he walked in and saw his beloved, handsome grandfather lying there, bleeding to death uh, with his legs missing, his, one of his arms shattered. And as he did so, it must have been that moment that he gained that famous passivity it was such a characteristic of Nicholas II. So, Alexander III succeeded. He cancelled all the reforms. He backed a very conservative, rigidly autocratic, uh, uh, anti very anti-Semitic um, freezing of Russia. No more reforms. When he died early, he was succeeded by the boy who'd stood with his skates and seen his grandfather die, Nicholas II. I won't tell you about his reign. You know about Rasputin. You know about uh, the tragedy of his son with hemophilia. We're jumping ahead now to that day, the 17th of July, 1918. Remember, Alexandra and Alexei are sitting at the front. The rest of the family, the father, Nick, the former emperor, now known as Colonel Romanov, 
was standing behind. Suddenly, the assassins filed in. Each of them had been told to assassinate one child, one person. And there were, there were the same number of assassins as there were members of the family and entourage. So one had been assigned to kill Nicholas II, one Alexandra. One each of the five children, four girls, teenagers, all of them were teenagers, and, and the boy, Alexei. But of course, when the moment came and they all raised them, Alex, Nicholas said, what the hell's going on? And Yurovsky, Comrade Yurovsky, the head of the assassination the squad, said, you've been sentenced to death and fire. Alex, and Nicholas just had time to say what before they start open fire, all of them. But none of them wanted to kill the children. None of them wanted to kill the daughters. So even though many of the assassins were drunk, many of them, some of them were, were actually psychopathic murderers, but many of them were drunken workers. And none of them wanted to shoot a child or a girl. So they all just turned their guns on Nicholas. Nicholas was hit with about a, a, rickish, a, a, a volley, a barrage of many, many bullets in the chest and died instantly. He was the lucky one. Then they shot Alexandra. They hated Alexandra too. The German woman, they called her. They killed her too. And now the children were all alive. The room was filled with smoke uh, and, and sawdust and plaster. No one could see anything. Everyone was coughing. It was a scene of, 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 of absolute bedlam. Uh, there was blood everywhere. People were coughing. People were screaming. And when the smoke cleared, Yurovsky said, stop shooting everybody. In fact, one of the assassins had even shot another assassin in the hand. Many of them are suffering from burns. And when, they, when the smoke cleared, they found out that virtually all the family was still alive. They fired again at the children, at the girls, but the bullets bounced off them. I said they'd prepared to move that the night before. And the way they'd prepared was to, was to sew on the diamond-encrusted underwear that they'd used to hide the Romanov diamonds. These were the diamonds that they'd taken with them from St. Petersburg to pay for their escape or to pay for their life, to pay for their life in exile. They'd spent months sewing them into underwear, into vests, into pantaloons, so, so that they could be carried without anyone knowing. Now, ironically, by wearing them, they'd made their own deaths much, much more painful. The assassins couldn't understand how virtually everyone was still alive. So they plunged into the scene, and they had to stab them, shoot them in the head, or stab them with, uh, with bayonets. It's hard to imagine a more uh, incompetent, more bungled, more heartless, more brutal uh, mess than this. And it was only the beginning. As they carried out the bodies, two of the girls woke up and had to be killed all over again. This is the origin of the story that, probably, of the story that Anastasia, or one of the girls, had survived. Because many people were hanging around waiting to, to help bury the bodies or help dispose of the bodies. So that was the story of the Romanov dynasty, ladies and gentlemen. And that's how it ended. Thank you very much. There's, if anyone wants to ask a question, um, please do. I know I've gone on terribly long. I apologize. We have covered a lot of centuries, though. Um, uh, do ask anything. If anyone wants to ask anything, I'd love to do it. Or else, or else just come and write to me on Twitter or Facebook or something. Or, um, or come and get your book signed. But if there are any questions, do ask. I'd love to talk to you. There's somebody at the back there. We've just got, we've just got time for a couple. Oh, yeah, here. So, so every few years, that there's a story comes out about Anastasia. Complete tosh. She, she, she died. That's she died, end. yeah. Anastasia did not survive. And none of them survived. Um, so I'm afraid those stories, were, none of them were true. They were all wishful thinking. We all, want, we all wanted those children to survive. Um, well, I think we've got time for just sort of two questions. Yeah, this, this lady here at the front. <laughs> 
And then we've got one more, if, you, if anyone has one. In your um, presentation, you talked a lot about the gruesome ways they killed people. Was it actually like compulsory? Where was there any czar who insisted on not executing people at all? Or was it just a part of their regime in general? Yeah, it's a good question. And I know that I've, I've horrified some of you with the details um, of the executions. Um, but this was life in the, in the Russian court. Most of these, many of these czars were killed by their own family and entourage. And it's actually interesting that many of Peter the Great's methods of execution were actually copied from the West and sign were signs of Germanic or British civilization. So, you know, being hanged, drawn, and quartered, for example, actually was a Western punishment that they'd brought, imported to Russia. Um, but the Russia had its own appalling ways of executing people, and there were always executions, except for a period in the 18th century when the Empress Elizabeth canceled the death penalty. So there was a long period with no executions. One more, couple more questions, one more question. One of those gentlemen over there with shades on. Thank you. Can you uh, tell us a bit more about Peter III's uh, strange fascination with Frederick the Great? I mean, it's sort of a weird relationship these two guys had. And did they talk to each other? Or was, they, was there a pen pal thing? What was, it, what was going on there? Well, th this is a good question. Um, Peter III's obsession with Frederick the Great, is that right? Um, Peter, Peter III was a very strange czar. He was only czar for six months. He was extremely unpopular, unattractive, and, and frankly foolish. Um, and um, he was obsessed with, with Frederick the Great. He hated Russia. He hated Russians. And as soon as he became um, czar, he cancelled his foreign policy, uh, cancelled his, uh, his predecessor's foreign policy, and Russia was at war and had been fighting a long war with Prussia. He cancelled it and made a very advantageous peace with Frederick the Great, who was his hero. Frederick the Great literally could not believe his luck. Um, one fascinating connection with that is that when Hitler was in the, um, was in the bunker in, 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 in um, March 1945, was doomed to, fe doomed to defeat, he longed for the miracle of Frederick the Great that had saved Frederick the Great at the last minute. And of course, it never came. Ladies and gentlemen, I think, I think you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much. And do come and um, I'd love to sign any books or I'd love to sign any books or say hello. Thank you very much.